Uh, dear colleagues, good afternoon, dear friends. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Christian Herpfer. I'm the president of the World Weather Survey Association. Earlier this year, the World Weather Survey Association has started a new tradition, an annual honorary lecture where we commemorate the memory and scientific legacy <coughs> of the founder of the World Weather Survey Research Project, Professor Ronald F. Ingelhardt. And today on December 8th, we have this very first prestigious lecture. I'm very pleased to see so many colleagues coming to our first lecture today. Professor Ronald Ingelhardt, one of the most famous and influential political scientists of our generation, has of no doubt been a source of inspiration for many. Ronald F. Ingelhardt was the founder and the first president of the world famous Verbal Survey for more than 30 years, uh, from 1981 to 2013. He created and directed the value survey, which developed and expanded thanks to his outstanding academic leadership to the biggest social science survey research program in the world. Together with the value survey as a research program, Ron Inglehart created also the biggest social survey infrastructure in academic survey research with national teams of leading scholars in more than 120 countries and societies in all continents across the globe. <clears throat> the biggest survey research program in the social sciences worldwide had its institutional academic base and center at the University of Michigan under the leadership of Ron Inglehart, who served as Levenstein Professor of Political Science as well as a research professor at the Center for Political Studies during his success story as a true giant of modern political and social sciences in this excellent American university. Ron is one of the most cited political scientists in the world, with more than 140,000 citations in other academic publications. He has an Hirsch index of 120 and an I-10 index of 369. This means 369 of his publications have been cited 10 times or more. And uh, Hirsch index of 120 means that his publication record represents the equivalent and an accumulated age index of six full professors of political science in the UK. A true giant. Based on the University of Michigan, Ron developed an international collaboration with leading universities like Harvard University, Princeton University in the USA, the University of Cambridge, University of Southampton, King's College London, University of Aberdeen in the UK, Australian National University in Canberra, University of Sydney in Melbourne in Australia, Lausanne University and Free University Berlin in Germany, University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, University of Jordan, Qatar University, United Arab Emirates University, Kefri University in Uruguay, Beijing University and Shanghai Chantong University in China, University of Bucharest, University of Warsaw, University of Vienna, Institute for Future Studies in Sweden, University of Almeria in Spain, Istanbul University, and many dozens of other famous universities and institutes around the globe. Ron Inglehart was not only directing a huge global research program with now more than 600,000 successful face-to-face -face interviews in 120 countries and societies worldwide. He published almost every year an academic book and his most recent book was published last year in 2021. His influential and famous as well as best-selling books have been translated in many world languages and have been used in hundreds of universities in undergraduate and postgraduate teaching and learning of thousands of students on all continents. It is our greatest honor and noble duty to continue the great vocation and mission of Ron Inglehart to support, to develop, to multiply his legacy in the fields of social and political sciences. To commemorate the scientific, scientific legacy of Ron Inglehart and his fundamental contribution into the values and political cultural research, <clears throat> the World Research Association has announced this new prize the annual memorial Ronald Inglehart lecture that will carry the name of our respected founder. We are extremely grateful to the generous and long-term financial support of this prestigious new prize to Professor Marita Inglehart from the University of Michigan, who was supporting Ron over many decades as his wife and soulmate. And we would like also to express 
our deep gratitude to the whole Inkhart family. Many of them are in presence today. This year, in 2022, uh, the prestigious winner of the first Donald Inglehart Annual Lecture Prize is Professor Russell Dalton from the University of California, Avern in the United States of America. Russell Dalton received his PhD from the University of Michigan with Ron Inglehart being a supervisor of his PhD dissertation. After two years doing international surveys for the US government, Dalton joined the faculty at Florida State University, and after a decade, he moved back to California and to the University of California, Avon. His research focuses on the changing patterns of citizenship in the US and other affluent democracies, and how these trends are reshaping the democratic process. Much of his research utilized the weather survey or the Eurobarometers that are products of Ron Inglehart's institution building achievements. Uh, Professor Dalton has offered or edited more than 30 books and over 200 articles and book chapters. Several generations of college students learned about public opinion research through Dalton's widely read citizen politics. His book has, uh, books have been published by Harvard University Press, the University Press, MIT Press, Cambridge University Press, and very often by Oxford University Press. One of these books, uh, which was called The Civic Culture Transformed and co-edited with the Vice President of the Welfare Survey, Chris Wenzel, is a fast shift for an Inglehart and a celebration of the Welfare Survey. The topic of President Dalton's lecture today is social modernization and political tolerance in America, the untold story. After uh, his presentation of his annual lecture, in the remaining time, we have a question and answer session with the audience uh, and uh, Professor Marita Inglehart will also make a statement. Hence, if you have a general or specific question to Professor Dalton, please raise your hand during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can use the chat function to post a question on the chat uh, boxes. Now, I would like to give the floor to our first winner of the Ron Inglehart Memorial Lecture of this year. Professor Russell Dalton. Professor Dalton, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, um... Should I? I think, uh, can you share please uh, your presentation? Okay. Can you see that? No. Not yet. Senior, can you please support Professor Dalton? Uh, let's try. Uh, I see myself uh, boxes for Marita and Christian. So underneath the boxes, there is a green button share screen. If you can press on that one, please. Okay. And then select the uh, screen with your presentation. At the bottom, there is a green uh, arrow called share screen. Right. Yes. Can you see that now? Uh, yes, perfect. Yes. So hello, uh, I want to thank the World Values Association 
the global network of world value scholars, Marita and the Engelhardt family, for the invitation to present the first Engelhardt, Ronald Engelhardt Memorial Lecture. Ron provided guidance, mentorship to me and many other scholars. So I, in a sense, feel like I'm representing all the people that Ron touched in his life. That made me wonder why me, of all the people, was picked for the first lecture. And, and I'm going to claim age. I think um, I've known Ron probably more years than anyone who's watching this presentation. I first met Ron when he was a young assistant professor at the University of Michigan before he published his landmark uh, Silent Revolution article in the APSR, uh, because that was the time when I entered University of Michigan as a graduate student. Ann Arbor was an incredible place then. If you could imagine the best sports team you ever known in whatever sport you're a favorite of, Ann Arbor was better as a political behavior team. It was Campbell, Converse, Miller, Stokes, Sam Barnes, Joel Auberbach, Roy Pierce, and others. Uh, international scholars coming constantly to visit. And the rookies on the team were two people you probably know, Bob Putnam and Ron Engelhardt. I first took a class in political socialization for Ron, from Ron where we read the silent revolution. And, and that really touched me because it was a story about my generation. I learned that to some extent I was a post-materialist and that Ron's framework gave a, a way to think about how society was changing in the 70s and the 80s. One of the best things was Ron about Ron was he taught by example. He was always busy. Back in those old days, he was often shuttling punch cards to analyze Eurobarometer data. And he was at the computing center at North Campus or working on his projects. But when it came as to his students, he found time to write long detailed comments and student papers, a model I followed. He taught with gusto. I later learned that that was probably because of his love of Broadway shows. Ron was a role model when I was his TA, when I was an RA on the Eurobarometer and political action projects, his house sitter, and his occasional dinner guest. Uh, but the real appeal was Ron had a theory that was so powerful and rich that informed so many things that were going on in the world today. And Ron's research and the research of other people showed it so that when my colleague Bernie Groffman recently did a study of citation counts among political scientists and all PhD departments in the United States, Ron ranked number one in citations among all American scholars. Uh, let me close with an anecdote about the graduate culture of Ann Arbor and Ron's impact back in the day. The graduate students used to tell a story that Ron had so many good ideas that he couldn't decide which ones to work on and which ones not. And the ones that he didn't decide could be your dissertation theory, thesis. Well, coincidentally, my first published article tested Ron's idea about cohort analysis of value change using Eurobarometer data. So from the beginning, I've owed a debt to Ron of guiding my research. And now I wanna give a talk that I think Ron would enjoy. Uh, because it's about how social modernization has impacted on democratic values. And Ron and Chris Wetzel have written about this on a global scale using the World Values Survey. 
uh, beginning from the start of Ron's work up to the present. So if you look at this quote, it talks about how the liberalizing forces of social modernization is changing our views of society. Today, I wanna to focus on one aspect of the political values that many political observers here in the United States claim are lacking among the American public. And I picked the United States in part because I was an American. This was the starting chapter of the book I was working on but in part because we have a long stream of data and are able to look at developmental processes back to the 70s or even before. And the aspect I wanna talk about today is political tolerance because from Dahl to Norman Nye to James Gibson, there's been this emphasis on political tolerance as one of the most fundamental democratic values. It's why the First Amendment of the United States Constitution talks about the right to free speech and assembly, that you can't have democracy if there isn't tolerance towards the people you disagree with. There's a question about whether this Im applies to the United States anymore. For the last four years and beyond, there had six years, eight years, 10 years, there's been a rising concern about the viability of democracy in America, the implosion of democracy, uh, the death of democracy. If you read any of these quotes, it's like all the others uh, coming from various media sources uh, across the United States, from Brookings Institution of Foreign Affairs to the newspapers, the, the kind of death of democracy and the decline of citizenship seems to be the motif of politics among the chattering class. So I pick political tolerance as a root democratic value to see if we are becoming intolerant, if we have this hostility towards political speech. And the question is, how do you assess it? And there are multiple ways. Um, I use a variety of data sets in the analyses I've done to look at it in different ways because of the historical element of social modernization. I wanted to pick something that could give me as long and rich a time series as possible. So I turned to the general social survey. The general social survey is done by the University of Chicago uh, every two years approximately, going back to the early 70s. And they used a method of asking people about contentious, certain contentious groups. Should they be allowed to speak in your community? Should they be allowed to teach in a college or a university? Should the local library look, allow a book by the author? Stauffer used this in a path-breaking study of the widespread intolerance of America in the 1950s, in the middle of the Red Scare and the Lavender Scare and the intensity of post-war American politics back then. GSS has adapted that method and asked about the contentious groups, if you may, that of communist, homosexuals, anti-religious, atheists, militarists, and racist. So they have liberal groups, conservative groups asked about three different activities that they might pursue, which for those of you in the World Values Survey know that this is an awful lot of questionnaire time that takes time to ask all of these questions, but provides a probably unique database of the last four decades plus of tolerance in America. There are other methods, and if you want, I can talk about some of them. Uh, Jim Gibson has used diff a different approach. Uh, a variety of different surveys have asked questions differently, and I'll give some of that today. 
So I want to start with a, um, a question for you to think about before I go on. This is the range of data that I have available from GSS from 1976 to 2018. 76, I was still a graduate student. 2018, I'm retired. So it's a pretty long time. The number of tolerant responses with five groups and three items uh, could be zero to 15. So the horizontal scale will show the number of tolerant replies over time. And, I, and the thought experiment is when was America most tolerant? And I've tried that with a lot of colleagues as I prepared this talk. And most don't get it very accurate. Give you, give you a clue. It started in the first survey of eight tolerant replies. So out of the 15 possible things, about half of the examples, maybe somebody was intolerant towards communists, or maybe somebody thought none of these things should be done in a college, or none of these things should be book in a library where the kid might read them. But you average all of those things together and and eight out of 15 responses were tolerant, which one would think isn't a really good score because that means lots of groups or lots of activities are being left out. But over time, and I think this is what Ron would like, there's been an increase and almost a linear increase given sampling error and the other slight of variations that one gets in uh, public opinion surveys from eight to almost 11 responses in that 40 year period. Now, one might ask, well, maybe that's because people have become more tolerant of some groups, but not tolerant towards other groups, or is this a general pattern of tolerance towards all of the five groups? Uh, that are used in the GSS survey. So I, as a next step, disaggregated responses towards each of those five groups and counted up the number of responses and made it a, a, a zero to one scale. All of those groups uh, with one exception, have followed the same upward course at different rates of speed. The most striking change is tolerance of homosexuals who've gone from living in the shadow of society to being the most tolerant, tolerated group to uh, teach, talk, or uh, uh, be active as a political participant. But it's the same for atheists and anti-religious groups, for communists, for militarists. And the interesting thing is that it isn't tied to political events. If it was communist, one might, if it was tied to political events, the the best example might be uh, for communists and the fall of the Berlin Wall might have a dramatic impact on attitudes towards communists in the United States. But if one looks less data, so a little more wobbling, uh, again, an almost straight line up over 42 years. Uh, the same with militarists, one might think that a variety of, of political events in American history might shape or dramatically influence those tolerance of those people who want a strong military government, uh, influence on government. But again, if you draw a line, that's about as good as we get with survey data to go up. The one exception is uh, tolerance of racists. 
there's an excellent piece by Chong and Jack Citron in the most recent perspectives on politics. It might even be a pre preprint print where they look at some of these same, same data and examine this in detail and then go on and collect other data about tolerance in America. And it seems that attitudes towards racists is an exception to the general rule, regardless of how it's measured. And we can come back to this later, maybe in the discussion of why that's the case that uh, other groups are tolerated except people who are racist. If one went back further in time, the historic changes are even greater. The willingness to allow a communist to teach in a, in a college or a school has increased, uh, what, four or five times over the last, what, I'm trying to figure out the math, over the last um, 65 years, roughly, 60 some years, anti-religion's willingness to teach has gone up about four times over that period. So if we go back to the original Stoffer survey where these, sur where these questions were first asked, you can see America was a very intolerant place back in the 1950s. And the qualitative change in the culture is something we perhaps don't realize because like the previous figure showed, every year a little bit changes, every year a little bit changes. And we don't think of what was it like 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. When I first started teaching in Tallahassee and, and taught a large number of things that were related to Ron's work. It was hard for students to have a sense of how much politics was changing. And then I would use the example that in Tallahassee, Florida, so this was the late, late 70s, uh, 10 years earlier, the McDonald's across from campus wouldn't allow black people in. The movie theater had a balcony for black people to watch a movie where they wouldn't be on the main floor with whites. And for the students, it was like telling them that um, this is ancient history, something that happened a hundred years ago because so much had changed by the seventies that they couldn't imagine that that was the status quo in the 60s. And that has continued on for the next 42 years. So one might say that there are problems with the GSS survey. Uh, I would like to ask, well, if this was a journal review, uh, a journal being submitted, reviewer number two would ask for different methodology and ask for different questions. Uh, that's a possibility that the Stoffer questions some have some bias. So I looked for other sources. An even longer source is, so this is not, do you like communists? Do you like atheists or anti-religionists? But should they be given free speech? Should they be allowed to participate in the democratic process openly to express their views? Uh, which comes closest to the principles of democratic values. A number of other surveys have asked about attitudes towards these groups. Do you like or dislike the groups? Do you favor or disfavor this policy? The longest series that exists is the Gallup surveys that 
from the 1950s have asked a variety of questions about, again, what they considered contentious issues in American politics. They asked people, would you elect a Jewish person as president? Would you vote for a woman as president? Would you vote for a black person as president? All of these lines show a substantial increase over time. Uh, most of them converge around 90% uh, leading up to the most recent survey in 2022. Two other questions asked about marriage. So they were looking for questions that could apply to different issues of contention. Probably the strongest evidence of culture change I've, I've seen in public opinion survey is accept, public acceptance of interracial marriage. In the late 50s, it was 4%. In the most recent Gallup survey after 2020, it was 94%. Now, given coding error and everything else, that's almost from 4% to 94%. Uh, a phenomenal change in the space of our lifetimes. So some people might be saying things are like this because they um, know what's socially acceptable. But if one looks at statistics for interracial marriage, they're also going up. Gay marriage is another example, uh, accepted by 20%, now by 60% of Americans. In 2022, 20, the Senate and House are passing legislation to, to formally legal, legalize marriage equality after the Supreme Court decision. Uh, I think that would have been unimaginable when I was a graduate student in Ann Arbor because society was just a fundamentally different society 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago. And, and again, this is a different source answering, asking different questions, coming to the same conclusion. Another source, this is from Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now. Interestingly, Pinker comes out almost as a um, restatement of Ron's uh, social modernizations. Uh, theory using cross-national data from the World Value Survey, but he also presents attitudinal questions about uh, should school boards have the right to fire teachers or homosexuals decreases over time. Not very high because it starts in the mid 80s, but it goes down sub substantially. Should women return to their traditional roles, that declines. Is it all right for blacks and whites to date each other? That declines. And again, if I bring it back to the experience and I use Tallahassee because that was a Southern state within a decade after the end of desegregation and I can't remember knowing an interracial couple and no, I knew one interracial couple in Tallahassee. Now, when we go back to visit friends, um, it's like a, a different society than I was living in at the time. So I wanna stop for a second and, and ask you to think why is there this disconnect? Why are our academics, pundits, the media telling us uh, intoler tolerance is in short supply in America? 
Republicans won't talk to Democrats. They don't want their kids to marry Democrats. Democrats don't want their kids to marry Republicans. Families breaking apart. Why could that be if the empirical evidence is very different? Um, I think I've seen so many books and articles about the imminent death democracy, how democracies die, the failure of democracy, the decline of democracy, that it's become a kind of cottage industry. So that disconnect between what I saw in public opinion surveys in my life in the world around me versus what academics were writing about and media people on TV were talking about led to this research to look at it more systematically. Why could there be this change and why is it being missed? And I'd like to come to back to that at the end and just take this pause to ask you to think about is there disconnects? Oh, in fact, one of the most entertaining examples is, um, is doing research for this. I found one article that actually picked the day democracy was going to die in the United States. And it was January 6, 2024. Uh, why this angst versus this positive story that I've been telling? Well, one way to get a better understanding of all this is to do what Ron would have done, except when he did it early with the Eurobarm, as I mentioned earlier, he would put his punch cards together and go up to the North Campus and run data and see what the correlates of tolerance were or the correlates of post-materialism is. So in that vein, I want to show you some of the trends in group level tolerance in America. For example, the changes in tolerance by education over time. On the one hand, they haven't been very great because graduate students, people with a graduate degree or with a college degree have always been relatively tolerant. That's a common finding in the tolerance literature. But what has changed is the number of people at both ends. The number of people who have a, a BA or higher degree has increased by half from around 30% to 45% over time. And the number of people who have less than a high school degree has decreased from about a third of the electorate to a tenth of the electorate. The social modernization forces of educational change and other changes in social status have increased those who've always been tolerant and decreased those that at lower levels of education where tolerance was lower. Although it's, as society changes, what I found interesting is the greatest increase in tolerance has come among those with less than a high school degree. And I think that's a reflection that they don't just change. Societal change just doesn't affect the individual, it affects the context. And the context is so changed that what was acceptable then is no longer acceptable today. Now, a figure Ron would really like would be a comparison by generation. And it's quite evident this is generation coded by when people came of age, of 18 years of age. From World War I, at the earliest survey, there were still some significant number of Americans who came of age 
uh, between World War I and the onset of uh, the Second World War. Then the greatest generation, the World War II generation, came next. Then the, the boomers who came of age in the post-war boom, etc., up to millennials. You see this march of generational change steadily occurring as older generations die out. They're replaced by millennials who are the most tolerant today of any generation. Uh, this might seem a uh, surprise in the sense that young people don't get a very positive rap about many things. Uh, they're apolitical, they don't vote. Um, they're too concerned about either getting a good grade or getting a good date, um, watching their phones, doing something else. But their value, if you take a generational change of turnover, driving, social modernization, post-material values. The, the millennials are the latest point in that process. So as they fully entered the electorate, they become the most tolerant generation. There, there's one other point, almost all the lines are flat. When a generation comes in, its values are set. So it isn't that in most cases, social change is, is moving them because that might be a question if you look at the education figures. At the generational level, people's views get set about these kind of basic issues and then start to change. So the, the one exception to this is the 80s generation that came in somewhat low and has moved up over time. Or uh, the 60s generation is also interesting, the, the kind of hippie generation of the 60s where the counterculture movement influenced people most in a tolerant and supportive way of diversity. Those groups have remained very tolerant over time but they've been joined now by others. And if you look at the kind of social modernization predictions, education, cognitive skills, uh, a measure in the GSS that asks knowledge of the meaning of uh, 10 different words, occupational prestige, income, the size of community, urban, rural, have all, are all positively related to tolerance, but their impact has decreased because tolerance has become so widespread, the explainable variance is, has decreased over time. And society, it isn't that these divisions still exist, that they, but they diminish the differences between us are smaller from rural to urban than they were 20 years ago. And fortunately, GSS uh, included the four item old style post-material item in one survey. And it shows as one would expect that tolerance and post-materialism go together. Now this might be a surprise. Uh, because historically there's been a, a relationship between tolerance and liberal conservative values. Uh, it applied both in the early stopper surveys and in most other data that it's, has tested tolerance. But the surprise is that liberals have 
increased slightly in tolerance over time, over 42 years. And the biggest increase in tolerance has come from conservatives. Liberals increased by about a point and a half. Conservatives in increased by three points on the scale, twice as much, right? And centrists on the left-right scale are about the middle of those two things. So we think of America as polarized between left and right, that we don't have shared values, that they're the good guys and we're the, we're the good guys and they're the bad guys. That how could they do that because they don't share my democratic values? There are differences, but now the differences are small. There's a convergence on our basic values which again raises the question of why are so many pundits telling us the sky is falling? So back to the question I asked you to think about earlier, why is public discourse so pessimistic about citizens? Actually, the test of these ideas comes in the next chapter I was working on when the pandemic happened. Uh, and I haven't returned to the project because of, of a variety of, of things. But I started tinkering and I want to share what I think some of the things that are described in the literature, if not tested empirically. Uh, from my non-survey research colleagues, I hear the common criticism that opinion surveys are inaccurate. Um, this is part of the reason why I turned to the GSS as one of the highest quality in-person uh, scientific surveys that are done in America. Uh, if there's a gold standard for surveys, ANES and GSS probably get that gold standard. It might be that people are not answering accurate. There was a tolerance of the intolerance back in the 60s and 70s. Now there's an, a reverse pattern where people know it's politically correct to uh, say certain answers. I suspect that is uh, true to some extent, but Pinker has interesting data that he collected out of Google searches that shows that Google searches for keywords that, that reflect intolerance of people searching for the N-word or slurs against uh, homosexuals has decreased over time. So the private behavior of people on their phones or on their computers shows the same thing, that same trends as what we're seeing with the public opinion surveys. Another possibility is that intolerance has become dispersed, not focused on a few groups. Uh, in my larger project, I look at this by a, a different methodology. And except for racists to pop up as a most disliked group, it seems that there are some people who are intolerant to some group somewhere but few groups have a significant number of people who are intolerant towards them. Uh, so that's a possibility that uh, exists. I'm more, so I, I guess I'm going from the least likely to the most likely in my opinion. I think 
one of the problems we face is that social media are is giving a voice to the most extreme and loudest who are not necessarily most representative of what average people think about politics. There's also a, a negativity bias, I think, among scholars. Uh, we're trained as scholars to be critical, to look for something to criticize. We're not looked to say, look for good things. Um, at best, we should be asking ourselves, what's the answer to this question, good or bad? But I have a sense a lot of people look for something to criticize among the scholarly community. Let me show how bad this situation is, because I feel it's bad. I'm gonna, I'm not, not separating my own views from my research. And that's always a channel challenge in social science because we're stu studying human beings and people around us, not an inanimate object. Oops. Another part is that bad news sells. If, if most of life is positive interactions with other people, you get on a plane, everybody's fine on a plane, they have a nice time, they get the vacation, they return home. That doesn't make the news. But if someone gets on a plane, starts screaming at someone else, uh, is disruptive, that's what we hear about. And if you're an average citizen and you watch the news, separate from the social media or academic writings, bad news sells. If one was to write a book about democracy failing, it probably would get more clicks than democracy is ill, but it's it's an okay shape. And when we get an illness, we'll get better. And I think that's where we are now. We have an illness and we're getting better. We have challenges and we get through them. We have a cold and we get over it. Um, I'm a little concerned that I sense that some politicians, media, and scholars are stimulating negativity about citizens' values and American politics for their own interests. Um, it mobilizes voters. It gets more people to contribute. It gets more people to turn in to see the car crash. Um, it stimulates a negativity bias because the potential uh, personal benefits are greater. And last, I think people react to anecdotes. They remember the story on the plane or the one, the one bad interaction they had. And they generalize to that among the whole picture. They're not social scientists who say some people are this and some are that and let's get the percentages. And so it's very easy to come away from life in the United States or life in Germany or life in Britain to say the sky is falling. Uh, Five years time, if we get back together, I would predict the sky has not fallen. And there's other explanations. So these are my thoughts rather than my data. Um, so in, in conclusion, I would say, yes, certainly some people are still politically intolerant towards each of these groups. 
but uh, most Americans have become much more tolerant <laughs> through a process that's very similar to Ron's description of post-material value chains. I've talked about the United States, but Engelhardt, Betzel, Norris, Pinker, and probably many of you watching this have used the World Value Survey to find similar evidence of social modernization and value change. So in some sense, it isn't new, but we face a new context where the outside world is telling us the, the, a different story than what we're seeing in evidence. So the implications I draw is that as scholars, we need to reject the unfounded negative claims about intolerance that get fostered by, frankly, political groups on both sides. MAGA politics, woke politics, cancel culture politics, TV pundits, and recommend the shared democratic values among most citizens on the left and the right. In the universities, at least here in California and across the United States, the challenge is to allow Republicans on campus, uh, conservatives on campus, even if they're modest, moderate, reasonable Republicans and moder moderate, reasonable Democrats, they're treated differently. Instead, we should go out of our way to build a culture where tolerance is applied rather than just expressed in a public opinion survey. And instead of pointing fingers, we can strengthen our common bonds and accomplish more to improve the lives of citizens and the vitality of democracy. I think the hostility that has come in many of our countries in the last several years by people trying to exploit not our better angel, but our worst angel on our shoulder to, to think of the worst of others is where research can help show a different way that the world is different than what we see at night on television. So last, let me again, state that Ron was really a leader in all of the things that I said, and would probably, I hope, probably agree with everything I've said. And so from the silent revolution, the cultural evolution, he's been an influential figure in the lives of so many of us. And for me, I was lucky to start and I don't know if you can see the figure if it's blocked up, but on the far right is my first winter in Ann Arbor. And I unfortunately couldn't find a picture of Ron, but I found a new picture of Ron and an old picture of me to thank you for the invitation to the lecture. Okay, with that, I'll close and turn it over to Christian. Well, thank you very much, Russell, for this uh, impressive and fantastic talk. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor Marita Ingelhardt uh, to give a statement because Professor Ingelhardt and her family were contributing and also participating in the vote uh, who will be the lect uh, lecture of the year. And uh, so it's a sh shared experience of the governing body of the Earth Survey and the Ingelhardt family and uh, Professor Ingelhardt. And I would like to ask Professor Ingelhardt to make a statement uh, in this context. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christian, for organizing this. Thank you very much to Xenia, who uh, was in contact with us all the time. Um, you choose the perfect candidate. Ron would just have loved to see Russ give this lecture. Thank you so much. On the positive side, I also wanted to mention that, Christian, you were wrong. You did not see Ron's last book last year. In 2023, we, the University of Michigan Press will publish Ron's last collaboration with some wonderful colleagues. And the book is called um, China as Number One. And so I hope we can all look forward to this book 
And we can also look forward to the biography that Alejandro Moreno is writing. I saw five chapters by now, and he's doing a marvelous job trying to capture Ron as a person and Ron as a scientist. And he was another one of Ron's graduate students that um, was very, very fun, was very close to Ron's heart. But back to you, Russ, thank you for this fantastic topic that you choose. You could not have chosen a better topic because Ron was, from the moment I met him, I saw that he was one of the most tolerant people in the world and also a pure optimist. There was never a moment when he was pessimistic about anything. When people criticized his work viciously in lectures or on paper, he was never negative about it, but actually very interested to hear what they had to say. And he always said to me, it helps me become clearer in how I have to state what is going on. <laughs> he was not only tolerant of people who supported him, but he was also very tolerant of people who were very critical of him. Russ, I can tell you there's one person in this meeting that knows Ron much longer than you, and that is his sister Jane, who is here joining us today. I want to thank you for this talk. And I wonder what you have said if you had talked with Ron, who was very preoccupied with trust in the last months of his life and figuring out and talking very often with me about how is trust developing in this country among people. And I hope that you have some thoughts what you would have told him if he had asked you about that in connection with tolerance. He always said tolerance is growing, but what about trust? Is trust also coming out on the top as is tolerance? Thank you to you. I'm so happy that you were the first person who gave this um, award lecture for Ron. Thank you. Thank you, Marita. Russ, you want to respond to Marita's point or should we open the discussion? Um, well, I, I want to thank Marita for the kind words. Um, I, I picked this because I thought Ron would be happy to listen. Um, so your reaffirmation. Uh, uh, I think if one looks, so I, I've looked at American trends and European trends on trust and government, and there the story isn't so positive. Um, so we do have this divergence between the two. I, my sense is that democracies have to rethink how they're doing things. As a general rule, we have to figure out how to include more people in the political process. Uh, my last book was about the participation gap, the growing inequality in political voice across Western democracies that we're leaving behind a large share of the public. The people who are benefiting are the better educated, the more affluent, the people who have the skills and the resources. Uh, and politicians are listening to them. They're forgetting about the other side. And I think that's distorting politics, especially in the United States. You know, the incredible amount of money it being spent on elections in the United States and the dark money that comes into elections leads politicians to, well, there's this saying in American politics that if you're not at the table where the decisions are made, then you're on, on the menu. And there's a lot of people who aren't at the table now. We have to find ways to improve inclusion uh, I think I would say I just trust the government to do what is right. Um, and maybe I was always a cynic, but I've become more cynical. 
I think there are ways to do it. If one could limit funding, if one could limit the motivations to view politics as a way to gain wealth and power over public good, if one could find new input channels, I tell people the best democratic innovation I've heard in the last quarter century are these citizen assembly mini publics where you bring together groups of a representative group of people in a city or a state to talk about the issues confronting it and let them have input in. So it's representative, it's the public voice of all sorts. The work David Farrell has been doing with that and colleagues across Europe is a major advance if it's expanded. You know, back in the 1920s, the United States had many of the same problems of democracy, the robber barons and wealth and affluence and inequality, and it led to a period of democratic renewal. If we can get by this, I'm good, you're bad, we don't share values, maybe we some of these democratic reforms can get done. But we spend too much time talking about how my side is right and the other side is wrong. The world is black and white. Uh, and that makes it hard. So I hope one of the things by saying that liberals and conservatives have the same level of tolerance is to get liberals to realize conservatives aren't so bad and to get conservatives to realize that liberals aren't so bad, that we think alike in many ways. So I hope that's a, a helpful answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dalton, for your uh, amazing and uh, exciting lecture. Thank you, Professor Inglehardt, for your comments. Now we have an open question and answer session. On the bottom of your screen, you have an icon called raise hand. So please raise your hand and then uh, Dr. Kiselova will uh, give you the word and uh, feel free to ask questions, to make comments, etc. So the floor is open for the question and answer session. Could I start with, there's a, a Q&A from Jason about how um, tolerance in the United States compares to other countries? Yes, please. Uh, because my research project is really talk about affluent democracies. Uh, the difficult, it is, first, it's a really hard thing to measure because the social composition of different democracies vary so much. The political histories vary so much uh, that uh, compared to a lot of the things that we study, it's a greater challenge to find comparative data. The International Social Survey Program has asked questions about tolerance towards uh, a couple of generalized groups like revolutionaries. Uh, I think they have three different groups they've asked. Not so long a time series, not often asked, but the general pattern is that uh, tolerance increase, increases across Western democracies. Uh, but it's very sketchy. And even if you lose a question like revolutionaries, for an American, it might mean someone trying to overflow the, throw the government, or it might mean the American Revolution. For a Frenchman, it might mean the overthrow of the monarchy. Uh, so, so it's really difficult, uh, I think. So I've started to look at the cross-national data I would guess if, if one could find, the next step would be to look for national series like I have for the US. It is hard to believe that German tolerance in a historical time period that I'm looking at hasn't increased. 
um, the nature of German politics or French politics um, in the 60s and the 70s versus today still is problematic, but, but I would expect that good time series would show the same thing. Um, but as far as Jason asking, I only have scattered evidence so far. Thank you. The next uh, speaker is Andre Freer and then Mark Hoge. Andre, the floor is yours. Can you please unmute yourself, Andre? Can you hear me? I yes. Can. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank Hi, you for the. Hello, Ross. How are you? I would like to thank you for this very interesting and uh, stimulating and positive uh, lecture. Um, however, I I, 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 I think you you presented very convincing data and. Uh, very uh, from several sources. Uh, however, uh, I was thinking about uh, um, what we see in the real world and let alone the negative bias from scholars, from the media, from the social media, all that. What we see also is uh, increasing support for uh, politicians that are becoming more and more intolerant, uh, at least with their opponents. And you see that in the US, you see that in Brazil with Bolsonaro, you saw it with Trump, you see, you see it in Europe. And so um, I think there is a paradox you know, in the in the in the in the in the in the data and in the in the story you presented, which I think it was very interesting and uh, stimulating. And my question is is very simple. Do you think there is a a, a decalage between uh, these attitude data and the political behavior of individuals? Because many of them who perhaps say they are uh, very tolerant with um, the different groups you presented, uh, they nevertheless increasingly support uh, radical parties that are taking uh, intolerant positions. So this is my question. Uh, it, it's a great question. Uh... And, and, and I've heard it before, probably starting with the uh, previous US presidential election. Uh, let me use the American case, and I think it's similar to others. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, that we have uh, increasing share of the American electorate who had a lack of underrepresented in the political process. Uh, I think one could say the same thing about Brit British politics and a number of other advanced industrial democracies that went through deindustrialization, uh, the breakdown in the working class families, et cetera. And, and that, was uh, an opening for the mobilization of the discontented. If one looks at survey data uh, for the United States, people in the uh, Clinton-Trump election saw Trump as closer to their values than Hillary Clinton. That was because uh, Trump ran on a platform of, I'm out to look for you. I'm looking out for you. 
I'm not like these other guys who are in it for the money. He said to the seniors, I'm going to guarantee your social security. I'm going to get a better uh, public health care than Obamacare. I'm going to do all of these things that you want. Uh, so in public perceptions, he was saying what the disenchanted want to hear. Then he got in and followed a very different strategy and one could see public perceptions changing. I'd say that was a stress test for democracy. Uh, the good thing about democracy is when people make a decision, they can change their minds and get rid of someone and make a different decision the next time. The next time it came up, people perceived what he was uh, in terms of policy terms, very different than in 2016. Uh, he lost by 7 million votes. When he resisted leaving the presidency, there was an unprecedented alliance of business organizations, uh, CEOs of major corporations, uh, prominent Republicans, uh, from Mitt Romney, the former presidential candidate for the Republican Party, to a variety of others. Uh, there were civil society groups. There were 60 Supreme Court or uh, judicial court cases that went against Trump. And, and so it's like a, a stress test or a serious illness that if the good thing about democracy is if you get what you don't want, you can make a change. Uh, that's really hard when you're in the middle of struggling with an illness, but it happened in the United States. And now one sees almost week by week, the intolerant anti-democratic elements of the Trump administration leading to court cases, suits, uh, convictions, which shows that you know the antibodies in the democratic system are still working. When I talk to my colleagues, they only say, well, here's the bad things. You don't see the list of 30 prominent Republicans opposing Trump's, the civil society parts. Bullshit. Bolsonaro is an even stronger case because of the, the power that is potentially held by the, the presidency and the military in Brazil. And yet there was not an easy, but a transfer of power uh, at the last election. So it isn't to say that democracies aren't challenged, but that, you know, the old, um, Winston Churchill line that they're the worst form of government except for all the rest. Mm -hmm. And we've gone through a real bad stress test in the United States. And the stress test isn't about just policy, it's about democratic values. And that's where uh, Trump came out as a strong loser. Thank you. The next speaker is Mark Hoge. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much for a very excellent and convincing lecture and indeed uh, uh, as far as we know it's not just uh, this transition in the united states but also here in europe that we see it so thank you very much but i was still wondering about what drives the process towards more tolerance and we usually assume indeed higher average education rates but you show indeed that especially the lower educated have gained most tolerance. So I was wondering, one word that you didn't mention is religion. Uh, I mean, people for whom religion is very important tend to be less tolerant, eh? less tolerant towards other um, religious traditions, less tolerant towards homosexuality. So I was wondering, what is the role of secularization uh, the declining role of religion, does that lead to more tolerance? Uh, first, hi, Mark. Hi. I, <laughs> um, I think that 
is certainly part of it when it comes to things like homosexuality. Um, but religions have options and, and well, it applies to homosexuality. It's not clear if it applies to uh, communists and, and militarists and other challenging groups in the political process. But even in religion, uh, let me share an anecdote. And I think uh, I'll draw the lesson from it at the end. Uh, Bob Putnam has a, a wonderful book he wrote about our kids. And the book talks about how younger Americans, especially working class kids are being left behind. And he did a uh, study of different local examples to support the data that he was showing from public opinion surveys. And one of the local examples was in Orange County. And uh, when he came through, he was talking that he had met with the head of one of the largest evangelical churches in Orange County, Rick Warren's church in Saddleback, which is like a community of its own. It's um, a very traditional evangelical organization that has, um, I would think uh, uh, heavily disproportionate members are Republicans and conservative Republicans in a county that has actually been trending Democratic. And Bob said that Rick Warren told him they're facing a challenge because the younger members of his community are more tolerant than their older members. They don't understand why uh, they should be intolerant towards gay people. They don't understand why they should hold other certain values that, that isn't based on their sense of human values. And, and my point is that if it's pen penetrated a very active, very large, very successful evangelical community where the pastor is saying, um, we have to think, uh, rethink these kinds of issues because our members of our congregation are changing. It reflects that societal change isn't just one person, it's societal. And there is a, a, a process that goes on that gets, like I showed you, the greatest increase in tolerance was among the least educated because they see when the world changes, it doesn't collapse. That the friend that they knew who uh, dated a, a black man or woman is still a friend. Uh, that the guy that they, they knew turned out to be gay and things are okay, the world did not end. So I think it, it has this positive reinforcement. Uh, so I, I would hope um, re religions can be religious, but not all the things that Catholics believed 50 years ago, they still believe. Uh, and societies can change even if they remain Catholic. Mm -hmm. Thank Thanks, you very Martin. much. Uh, Russ, in the Q&A section, there is a written question to you about tolerance and discrimination. Uh, would you like to answer this um, question? It's about uh, liberals and uh, tolerance. Did, did you see it? Yeah, yeah, I'm reading it now. Okay, thank you.
Uh, so, so the basis of the question was that um, if liberals work together with conservatives and conservatives uh, are biased towards minorities, that would mean liberals are helping conservatives pass biased legislation. Um, legislation that, that handicaps minority groups or further handicaps minority groups. Uh, I think I understand the individual's concerns and I think they're real. Um, uh, but I guess I would say that um, one sees an over exaggeration of the differences between conservatives and liberals by taking a stance that they're bad and we're good. And instead thinking about where can we get together that we're both making progress on a shared goal. Now, let me tell you an example I use with um, uh, a close relative who was an, um, uh, an avid supporter of the Democratic Party and uh, could not watch TV when McConnell was Senator McConnell, the leader of the Republicans, were on TV because he was a extremely conservative Republican and a racist. Uh, this individual didn't know that uh, decades earlier, McConnell had adopted a black child and raised him as part of the family. It's those stereotypes that they're all black, we're all white, that exist on both sides that avoid progress and, and, and engage in only name calling. Uh, there are different solutions to racial equality. Uh, Republicans, I think, would support one solution. Democrats support another, but I'm not sure that they disagree on their basic beliefs the way that they used to disagree. And, and one last point on this is uh, if one doesn't get together, you're not going to see progress. And uh, it's striking in Los Angeles with a, a very liberal uh, government in California that we really haven't addressed the problem. Uh, California is the kind of most progressive, one of the most progressive states. Los Angeles is the most progressive one of the most progressive cities in the state. So it isn't a liberal conservative problem, it's, it's a community problem. And to, to always present it in liberal conservative terms slows down the potential to actually deal with the problems of minority communities in, in Los Angeles. Thank you very much. So the next speaker is President Sita Klingemann who worked since decades with Russell and uh, Ron Eaglehart. Uh, so Hans-Dieter, the floor is yours, please. Hello, Russ. Thank you for an inspiring talk. I have uh, often asked myself why <clears throat> in the profession we have so much of this kind of pessimistic conclusions uh, in uh, most of what you can read in the uh, current debate. Uh, do you think that it may have something to do with the ignorance of the historical dimension? And uh, would you agree that much of uh, the strength that we have uh, experienced 
from Ron Engelhardt's uh, theories comes from the fact that he has focused on generations and that by definition brings history back into the analysis. And uh, I cannot agree more with you uh, being in a situation here in Berlin and uh, giving talks and coming up with optimistic or with not so pessimistic conclusions, uh, you are kind of tolerated because uh, uh, people respect you for other things, but uh, they don't really believe uh, in what uh, comes out when you compare what you find with 50 or 60 years earlier. Thank you. Uh, okay. First, let me thank you, Hans. Uh, I, um, as a personal note, I always tell everyone that Hans is my German doctor or father. Uh, so it's a kind of, I've known uh, Hans Dieter almost as long as I've known Ron. And in fact, Hans, if you look, the picture in the frame behind my head is from an artist who had his work at the Centralis in Cologne that I brought back uh, after my year at working on the German electoral data project. And I schlepped it across the country every time I moved. Uh, so I apologize to others to have to for the personal digression. Um, yes, I think there's a, a negativity bias in academia, uh, in social science, because we look for problems. Um, uh, if things are good, you know, you don't go to the doctor when you're feeling well, you go to the doctor when you're ill. We think of, of what, what problems are we trying to understand? Why is this not working? Uh, and that's part of it. With students, I think the generational part is that Hans Dieter mentioned is clearly true. When I talk to students about this, uh, it's like, uh, an eye-opening experience because their time year experience, you know, you think of an undergraduate student or even a graduate student, their political, real political awareness is maybe five years, 10 years, and societal changes in that period are very small. And they say, well, not much has changed in my life. This problem is still there. What they don't realize is the problem we're dealing with now in many instances is much smaller than the problem that we had 30 or 40 years ago, which is why I bring up the uh, Tallahassee examples to them. And uh, a lot of my work is focused on cultural change or societal change over time because it gives us a context but not everybody does it. They, they focus on the last election. They focus on the crisis of the moment. Uh, it's the rise of far right parties to succeed to the concern about the rise of far left parties, to be concerned about the rise of green parties. I remember when I was, um, I think in Mannheim and the Greens were going to get entrance into the Bundestag for the first time. The New York Times was calling them Browns, a brown political movement wearing green shirts. So we have that built into us. Uh, and one of the things now we have with data is we can give a context or we can compare across nations. There are still problems and we'll still be drawn to them, but we have a better sense, I think, if we can uh, also consider uh, the progress that has been made and what was successful in the past and how that could be continued. Thank but you very much. but Thank this you very was, much. 
this was a, a great experience just to talk to Hans in person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Hans Dieter and Russ. I think we have two more uh, points in the chat, so maybe it, is, it should be the last one because we are coming to an end. One is by Professor Ursula Hoffmann Lange, and one is by, <laughs> by a person uh, who uh, asks about Protestants and Catholics in England. So, Russ, if you don't mind looking at the QA, then we are exploiting you today. So another question. You said uh, you got some note from uh, Hoffman Lange? It's, uh, is it possible that people have become more tolerant of other social groups, but less tolerant of supporters of the other party? Maybe they don't care whether to socialize with people of another race, sexual orientation or gender, as long as oh. you don't support the other party. This is the question of who's the for that. Yeah. Okay, I, I got this. I just had to scroll down. There's a yeah. first before that, an anonymous attendee asked about yes. how tolerance towards Catholics and Protestants change and groups change. That That's an excellent question. And the solution that uh, academics have used uh, is to, to maybe popularized by uh, a series of studies in the United States and then comparatively by Jim Gibson, is to give people a list of 12 groups and ask them what is the groups that they least like? Uh, what is, is there a group here that they are strongly negative to with different wording of that? Um, and I, and if we had long-term data, like the anonymous attendee asked back to earlier times, it might've been Catholics and Protestants in England. In a different country, it might've been X and Y. In some ways, up until the Ukraine, it seemed like communism was a passe term. Um, uh, what, uh, radical Muslim extremists wouldn't have been on the agenda before 9-11. Uh, so the groups change, but when they ask these open-ended questions, what strikes me is people can pick one group that they like the least. Uh, lots of groups get a small number of people to to pick them. A substantial number of people can't pick any group. And the only group in the United States that stands out as significantly disliked are racists. But across all the groups, uh, a majority of people are still tolerant towards them. And that suggests that even if the groups change, so we might pick some extreme group that's more extreme than the groups that we had in the past. But among the uh, present array of groups, uh, there's really has been uh, a dispersion of small numbers of people who dislike, but even when they dislike, they're tolerant. And if the anonymous attendee wanted to ask, I'll send them some of the tables I have that has uh, a variety of groups that they could look at. Then uh, Ursula Hoff, this is like a, uh, a Mannheim reunion uh, with Ursula Hoffman Lange. Hmm. Uh, so I, uh, uh, first 
first of all, it's very nice to hear from Ursula because it's been so many years, et cetera. This is like a reunion for the world values and German election studies and Eurobarometer family. Uh, I would interpret Ursula's question of whether social tolerance and partisan tolerance are somehow different. Um, like the exa example I mentioned earlier of a family member uh, or a, a relative, uh, we all have, probably all of us have some relative who um, voted for the other party. And we consider that they're good people, uh, but they have different values. Uh, where have we gotten to the place where if a friend votes for the other party, that um, disallows them from being a friend anymore? Uh, and I, I think it's because of this climate of polarization that the parties and politicians are producing to, to emphasize what divides us, not unites us. Probably the most positive source I've been reading in the research on this book is President Obama, who says, uh, look at what unites us rather than divides us. Um, don't look for if you're a, a, a Democrat for ways to attack Republicans. That isn't productive. Um, but he's a, a rare voice in a partisan landscape where the loud voices at the extreme yell the loudest and get the most money on their websites and most visibility on television. Uh, I think we have to say that we all have friends who are gay. We all have friends who are of a different religion. We all have friends who are something else. And they're, if we didn't know that before and we know it now, they're still friends uh, and look at it that way. Last. Yeah, as well, uh, Mrs. Marlene Constance and Vampa Socrates, and then we, I think we closed after that. Okay. Um, I don't, it, enforcing gives me pause because. Um, The, the power of the state should be not to force you to be tolerant, but to let you be tolerant. Because if you say they're going to force you to be tolerant, um, they can misuse it, at least from an American's perspective. Um, uh, the government can facilitate free expression, but can't enforce free expression. Because once it does, then it opens up um, uh, a framework for misuse. Uh, the whole Trump experience has been interesting because it led to a, a reevaluation of the Constitution and a realization that. Uh, you can't make people be good, but you can try to stop them from being bad. And the Constitution was very good on that by checking the power of uh, government to do something. So I've seen a lot of people here have new um, positivity towards the complexity of government, the diffusion of power, the checks and balances that five or 10 years ago, they were complaining because things couldn't get done. Now they were happy that things couldn't get done. So I only question this enforcement part. Um, that makes me nervous.
Thank you. Uh, Jason Sears is asking you kindly to send the data table to him. He is giving you his email address, Jason. Uh, so he, I put a question to you before that, and you okay. offer him some tables. Let me write it down. So uh, it's Jason at villageco.org. Okay. And this was the data way back from, oh, about um, disliked groups? I think, yes. Okay. I should also mention, for those of you who are still, uh, um, <clears throat> I've extracted data or parts of two chapters from this book project that will, uh, uh, kind of because of uh, Christians and Chris Wetzel's support will publish in the World Values uh, paper series early next year. And that'll have some of the data that I'm gonna send uh, to Jason. Thank you very much, thank you very much. So the very last one is by Socrates Corneodos, and then we finish, I promise. Uh, it's about education. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. But this is the last one, I promise. Uh, I would have to, uh, well, first, I want to uh, thank Socrates for the uh, question, uh, because it made me think, uh, in the American case, it might be different, uh, from other nations because the least educated uh, here used to be disproportionately white, but as uh, immigration has expanded, the uh, least educated are increasingly immigrants, Hispanics, uh, mixing with African Americans. So it might be that the, the composition of the least educated has changed. It might be that the experiences of the least educated have changed. So, so I guess what I'm saying is you're giving me a question that I'll have to go back and look at the data and think about. And thank, that's a good thing for giving a talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we are coming now to an end. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Russell Dalton for his uh, outstanding and really amazing lecture, which caused many people to ask him many questions. So the debate was a sign of the quality and of the originality of his presentation. I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Marita Ingelhardt and her family for supporting uh, this award and also the Inglehart Book Award which will come next year. And uh, I would like to thank also the uh, executive committee of the Weather Survey who voted for Russell as the first and foremost speaker of this year. So it was a joint activity of the famous Inglehart family and the governing body of the Weather Survey. And there was unanimity to uh, invite you, Russ, uh, to give this talk. And um, it was a fantastic experience for all of us. Uh, Marita or Russ, do you want to have a famous last words before we close down? Or... Marita? A very, very big thank you very much to everybody who contributed to make this happen. Russ, 
I will always remember you as the first speaker for Ron, and it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. You want to do some last words, being the first award winner of the Single Heart Prize. The right to close the session is yours. Um, I'm still at a, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm at a loss for words in the sense that, that I think this is the first name lecture I've uh, given. I also build my Facebook friends that this might be the last lecture I give now that I'm in retirement. And I couldn't figure out a better way to go out <clears throat> than to be the Ron Englehart lecture. So thank you all. Thank you. And uh, I would like to tell all participants that uh, this uh, uh, fantastic lecture was recorded and was also um, uh, distributed live on Facebook. So if you want to have a record of it, please either go to Facebook or to our secretariat. They will be happy to provide you with the whole record of the first annual Ronald Ingelhardt Memorial Lecture of 2022. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you much, uh, Russell, for spending all this time answering all these questions from all over the world, <coughs> from your colleagues from um, Mannheim, Berlin, and many other places. And um, I think it was a very good experience and we will report about it in our newsletter and on our website. So thank you very much indeed, Russ. Thank you very much, Professor Ingelhardt. Thank you for the uh, high level top audience all over the world. And herewith, I would like to conclude the first um, Ronald Ingelhardt Memorial Lecture in 2022. Thank you very much and take care and have a nice evening or morning, whatever. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>